1987. Even the sound of it sounded cool. Well, I think so anyway. This was the year, in my humblest of opinions, that put PC gaming on the map. Now, whilst I might not have had a Commodore Amiga, an Atari ST, or come to think of it, even a Master System, but what I can tell you is, when I played the games of 1987, something happened overnight. The games of 86, if anything, were a bit meh, but the games of 1987 were yeah. It didn't matter to me that the games might have looked better on the Amiga or something like that. I didn't care. I was oblivious to all of that Amiga nonsense. What I knew is it looked a lot cooler. Digitized sound was around 16 color EGA and VGA was hot on its tail. So I'm telling you, this was the year where things started turning around for the IBM PC. Some of the games were absolutely awesome. And here is the top 10 games of 1987 for the IBM PC. First up at number 10 here today is Street Sports Basketball. Now avid watchers of this top 10 series might know that I'm somewhat rubbish at sports but I'll make an exception in the case of Street Sports Basketball because somehow in all of its CGA glory I still managed to play reasonably well and therefore I thought you know what I'm being cruel to all those sports games out there I need to give this one kudos where it deserves the game is centered around three aside games the schoolyard, the alleyway, the parking lot and of course the all pervasive backyard. Each of these has its own hazards to play around such as oil slicks and potholes and your other dudes on the other team can get quite aggressive when it comes to it. I do like the basketball dunks, the passes and the steals. It's actually a really good wee game and I enjoyed it because it's much more realistic than all those ones on the basketball court. Highly recommended little game to get you started. Get ready for Mac 3. Next up is a game by Laura Ciel's. Now, Laura Ciel is a French company, and I think that might be one of the reasons that why, if you Google Mac 3 1987, you'll find that there's not very many results on the internet. However, this game I think has been bypassed by many non English speaking people. The sound is well, first of all, is one of the, the, the pioneering aspects of this game because it has digitized sound on the PC speaker. Quite how they did that is an imagination that I will leave to somebody else. But it has a kick-ass sound effect. It's got, you know, get ready for Mac 3 at the beginning. Some It's some French chick saying it as well, which is, you know, it's just quite hot sounding anyway. And then you've got the music, which is really good. And then you've got the gameplay. And the gameplay is actually really good, it's fast paced, sometimes it's a little bit difficult with the CGA graphics, gotta say it's a bit crummy, but other than that when you take it out and you just get on with playing it, it is actually quite a well polished little game. Two thumbs up to my French compadres there, Mac 3. The next one in at number 8 is Sierra Online's Dexter. It is a game which I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with. The game was originally released in the arcades earlier on in the 1980s and certainly has a great graphical appeal. It is incredibly difficult however and will cause much, much frustration. I mean, just look at the amount of times that I died just trying to create this video alone. I mean, I did remember it. I sort of got the hang of it eventually, but jeez, oh, I mean, if I want to get anywhere in this game, I'm seriously going to have to try. It is really hard. But once you get past that, and the increasing difficulty of the game, you find out that you're, well, you're a robot. And you can change into, well, a jet. And I don't really understand the logic of that, but some Japanese guy somewhere thought that's 
that's pretty normal. You you robot and you you turn into a jet. Anyway, it's pretty cool. The weapon auto aims, and you can use a shield as well to protect you from all kinds of badness. So when you switch the shield on, it kind of runs out of energy, so you only have the shield for a finite amount of time. But all in all, Dexter is a real push forward in the era of games for the PC at the time, and I've got to say, it still stands up as one of the defining moments of PC gaming. Thexter from Sierra Online. Electronic Gaming Monthly's Sean Baby placed this game at number 16 in his 20 worst games of all time feature. Well, I'm going to place it in my 10 top games of 1987. Bad Street Brawler is a game where, well, it, it pretty much doesn't take itself too seriously. And if you bear that in mind when you're playing this game, it's actually a lot of fun. The character Duke Davis, he goes along the way to, uh, well, beat up old ladies and strange old men who have swords. There's also other enemies such as gorillas and circus dwarfs who just happen to be on the same street, the bad street as it was. Uh, the, the old grannies, they, um, they throw their handbags at you and, well, the dwarves throw hammers. It's all very irregular, you know, this is no double dragon or golden axe. This is, <laughs> this is something else. And that's why I have a special place in my heart for Bad Street Brawler. Love the graphics, sound is horrible, but, you know, it's infinitely playable. I love the different moves, 15 stages of just undeniably silly fun. Here we have another game which almost passes as sport. Mini Putt by Accolade Software, the ultimate challenge apparently, I've heard that one before, but four players can either play a game or practice any hole on any course. And I've got to tell you, I'm rubbish at mini golf, but this one is a lot of fun. When I was uh, going through all the hundreds of games from 1987, this one was in the, you know, the back of the pile sort of stuff. I'll get to that eventually. And I sort of started playing it and then I started laughing. I, this is actually quite a lot of good fun. And I, I was disturbing to me because I didn't expect it to be that way. You know, what can I say? It's mini golf. It's on the PC and it's actually, wow. Ah, it hurts me to say this is actually really good fun. I think I've said that a few times now. Ah! My friend Matt likes to use the word shenanigans an awful lot, but if there were ever a set of circumstances to use the word shenanigans, then it would be for Maniac Mansion, because after a meteorite crash near the Maniac Mansion 20 years before, Dr. Fred has turned into a bit of a strange one and he's abducted Sandy and Dave is on his way to rescue her, but not without his band of many friends. If you are a fan of the LucasArts games, then you'll understand that the engine that they're built on is called Scum. And the games that came on Scum were of course big, big classics like Monkey Island, like Sam and Max, and of course, the one that came after Maniac Mansion, Day of the Tentacle. All of these games besides, this is the originator of the Scum engine. Maniac Mansion is a lot of fun. The graphics for 1987 were out of this world and the gameplay was just amazing. However, if you go back and you've played games like Fate of Atlantis and Sam and Max and so forth, and you go back to this one, you're like, Ehh. The gameplay isn't as easy, you can die. I mean, in LucasArts games, you can die. What's that all about? But yeah, it, it's still a great game and it does set the scene for any other scum adventure that you ever play. So if you like your scum adventures, you gotta go back to the grassroots and play this. Sometime in 1977, a portly little geezer by the name of Steve Wozniak decided to create a game called Breakout, and Breakout was awesome. Fast forward 10 years later, and many, many clones, you'll find the game Arkanoid. Well, Arkanoid is the ultimate Breakout clone. It's got power-ups galore, it's got neat little levels, it's got beautiful colours and sound effects, and basically everything you'd ever want in a bat and ball game. 
even if the story is about as iffy as they come, I mean just listen to this. The game's plot redefines the bat as the Vouse spaceship and the ball as an energy bolt. Bricks form a mysterious wall stopping the ship from progressing to safety. Publisher's disclaimer, no LSD was used at the time of creating this game. Thank you. Do play it, it's Arkanoid, it's bloody brilliant. From the moment that I got the keys to Accolade's test drive in 1987, it was clear that I had some lust for speed and I was only a kid. In fact, I was definitely nowhere near old enough to drive, but oh my god was this fun. The general idea with this one is, you head into a dealership one day, somehow some schmuck at the dealership manages to give you the keys to a Lamborghini Countach, a Ferrari Testarossa, or a Porsche 911, as well as some, well, lesser desirable cars in my opinion. You get in the driver's seat and the idea is you take this car for a joyride. I pretty much always took the Lamborghini for a wee spin because, well, it was just cooler than all the other cars. But uh, the general idea of this is that you drive along a hilly roadside somewhere presumably in the United States of America. And then you come across a petrol station and you pull in and it tells you how quickly you've gone. Depending on how mental you drive the car, you'll get points for that. Uh, there are obstacles along the way, of course, other drivers doing their Sunday drive. Back in those days in the States, the speed limit was a pedestrian 55 miles an hour. So of course, the coppers are on your tail all the time. You do have a little police radar somehow in this um, borrowed test-driven car, but uh, it'll tell you after a few seconds if the cops are near and you've got to evade them at speeds probably close to 200 miles an hour with oncoming traffic. Traffic. The main criticisms for Test Drive 1, which were somewhat repaired in Test Drive 2 and finally in Test Drive 3, was the controls, they were a bit sloppy, but mainly the biggest problem with Test Drive 1 was the fact you were in the same scenery pretty much all the time. With Test Drive 2, they had scenery packs and everything, making the visuals a little bit less mundane. However, let this not stop the fun here because Test Drive 1 was a game that I played a crap ton of times in 1987. Fantastic game. So I'm going to admit straight away that I am cheating here. Absolutely. I'm going to combine number two with two Sierra games. Police Quest in Pursuit of the Death Angel and Space Quest 2 Vohal's Revenge. Sonny Bonds is a small town policeman who must fight against the rising tide of drugs in the city. It was based on a real procedure by police and adheres carefully to the following rules of police work. It's a really good game, although I played it in 1991 when the VGA version was out, this game is pretty damn good. The only thing I really hate about this version of Police Quest is the really annoying way that you control your police car when you're in the street view. Other than that, it's a great adventure. But I'll move quickly on to Space Quest 2, where I've got to say there's a lot of people who edge towards Space Quest 3 being their favourite, but I'm kind of torn. I just I love the AGI games of the original Sierra games, and to me, Space Quest 2 was that beautiful green scenery, and I thought personally that the humour in the game was quite good, although again, many people disagree with that. They say the humour in Space Quest 2 was a bit wanting. I, on the other hand, think that this game is funny, the puzzles are intricate but not too hard, the gameplay is just long enough to get interesting, and, and it's, it's a beautiful game. Just Space Quest 2, I mean, hello, just one of the best franchises of adventure games ever. The ever-present Roger Wilco, the friendliest space janitor there ever was, is back in his second instalment, and this time he thought that Sludge Vohol, the baddie from Space Quest 1 with the Saryan encounter, was all gone. But oh no, he's back for his revenge, and he's 
in deep trouble now because Sludge Vohol, who looks absolutely nothing like Darth Vader, is out to get him. So, in conclusion, if you want laugh a minute, great fun, then you go for Space Quest 2. If you want a more realistic, yet slightly Miami Vice experience, then go with Police Quest. Either way, both of them are going to keep you entertained for days and days, and I love them both equally. What can I say? At number one, it has to be the most formative game of my life. Leisure Suit Larry in the Land of the Lounge Lizards. Now, I actually reviewed this game back in March when my old man came round to visit me from the UK, so if you haven't seen that video, check on that one now. Bearing in mind that I was just a cherub when this game came out, I found it on the hard drive of a PC that my dad bought from his mate. The PC sat in the corner of the living room innocently until I found out how to use MS-DOS and change directory into a ominously titled directory called LL. Once I ran Leisure Suit Larry, well, the rest is history. Larry Laffer is your character and he's a 38 year old loser. He lives in his mum's basement and it's basically make or break for him. He's decided that he needs to get his life in order and he needs to find the woman of his dreams and of course that all important factor needs to lose his virginity. Anything's possible, right? But when your personality is like Pee Wee Herman and your bank balance is like Bear Stearns circa 2009, this hapless little loser is going to need your help to achieve his mission. So you head into the city of Lost Wages and then you're on your quest. Let's just say the creator of this game, Arlo, is a comic genius as well. There's so many funny little innuendos in this game. What I found amazing is that Arlo himself was a high school teacher and until Leisure Suit Larry he was making Disney entertainment titles with Sierra. Initially the sales of the game were pretty shambolic and that was purely down to the reason that it received absolutely no marketing budget by Sierra because they thought it was probably quite lewd. But as time went on, of course, people started spreading the word about this entertaining smut and all over the world it became a success. If you include the non-Sierra games, there were nine follow-up games to Leisure Suit Larry across the years and that is quite the enduring title. Seriously, if you haven't played this game yet, why are you even watching this? I mean, you must have some sort of interest in retro games. So make sure you find yourself a copy, cease whatever evening plans you may have had, lock the children in their bedrooms and get on with Leisure Suit Larry in the land of the lounge lizards. So there you go, that's my roundup of 1987 and this one really is a hard year because there's just so many great titles to choose from and I know that many of my picks here are going to be incredibly controversial. This year really did embody the change in shift between the PC being an international business machine to an international gaming machine. Let's look out for 1988, that's coming up next. In the meantime, if you do like my videos, please consider subscribing, love it when you subscribe. And of course, if you want to support me, you can support me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Al's Geek Lab. Until next time, take care, thank you for watching and be excellent to each other.